Mark, I'm just curious, uh, appreciate you spending a few minutes with us. Mark Etheridge from D1 Baseball. What was your takeaway from a, a dominant performance this weekend for Ole Miss and Hattiesburg? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing is Ole Miss played about as well as they could play. I mean, you could nitpick, but go, uh, you know, two shutouts, uh, offense played well. It was just, um, you know, in that environment as well. I mean, it was, it was packed. Um, not an easy place to play. That was, you know, there, there's not a lot of holes in, in the performance. So that would be the first thing. I think the other is that we, we knew the lineup was strong. We knew Ole Miss could hit the ball. We, we knew they were, they were, you know, they could put up crooked numbers. What we didn't know was, you know, if how the starting pitching would perform. And, oh, my goodness, I mean, they had two incredible performances this weekend. And if they can get that, then, you know, it's a high ceiling club at that point. Yeah, and that's fascinating. I feel like largely right now Ole Miss fans and the conversation is about what just happened and, and not everybody has really turned the page. But since you kind of opened the door there, I mean, let, let's turn the page to the, the next chapter in this story, which is the College World Series in Omaha. They're on the side of the bracket with um, the winner of Auburn, Oregon State in game one. And then you got Arkansas and either Stanford or UConn, that game happening right now, UConn with an early lead. When you kind of have to handicap that side of the bracket, where do you start? You know, I mean – the whole the whole thing has changed after Tennessee's loss. I mean, we went in thinking it's Tennessee and then everyone else, and maybe somebody gets lucky. Now, I mean, who's the favorite? I mean, I, I really don't know. I mean, Texas is going to get some love, I think. Um, Texas A&M, you know, perhaps. You know, if Stanford or Oregon State, they would be the, the highest seeds left. But, I mean, honestly, they haven't played so well that, that they should be the favorite. I really think it's wide open. Now, I re- obviously, Ole Miss played great this weekend. The question is, can can they? Is this is this Ole Miss now? What well, what we've seen the last two weeks is this who they are, or was this you know favorable matchups and and things that went their way and and they're it, they're going to regress right or return to normal or whatever you want to call it. And I think that's the question. Um, because if they play like they have the last couple of weeks, they can beat anybody. And, yeah. and that, that's the, that's the intriguing part about this because you know, the other seven teams that are, that are going to be there are probably feeling pretty good about themselves too. So it's, it's going to be a really cool deal because, you know, we all thought it was Tennessee and everyone else was just going to, you know, try to pull the upset. Well, the upsets already happened. It was interesting to me that Scott Barry went there in his postgame press conference yesterday when he was asked or, or made reference to, you know, Ole Miss having as good a shot as any to win the national championship. And he was like, well, now that Tennessee's out, it feels like everybody's going to go in feeling like they've got a chance. I mean, it's not like just people that cover the game were saying that. People that were in the game were saying the exact same thing because of this historically dominant roster. Yeah. The, the thing about Tennessee is we've had teams that had really strong lineups. And which Tennessee obviously had. We've had teams that had really good pitching staffs, which Tennessee obviously had. But we didn't really have one team that had it that had both. They were the best in both categories, and they played good defense, and they had veteran players. They they kind of had everything, you know, except maybe maturity. And I, I think that that, that <laughs> might have might have been a problem this weekend um and you know notre dame was an older team they had what nine or ten guys who were graduates yeah and that was kind of their their kryptonite they they ran into a team that was just you know older and had had been through it had been to starkville the year before and and i think because of that that was just you know it was just a bad matchup for the balls Mark, I'm I'm going to lean on your uh, your, your college baseball. Not, but if if you're not exactly sure who Mark Etheridge is, he's at D1 Baseball now, and he focuses primarily his coverage on the Southeast. But before there was a D1 Baseball, if you were a uh, to borrow an Eric Sorensen term, if you were a stitchhead, you knew about this website called SEBaseball.com. 
It was the only message board that was out there for college baseball fans, and that was Mark's baby. That's where it all started, and I, I think a lot of the the growth of college baseball in the southeastern part of the country um, kind of goes back to that. And, and we're talking like late '90s, early 2000s when uh, when that was a thing. So Mark's been doing this for a while. So I'm going to kind of lean on your historical database inside your head here. We're looking at most four top 16s making it to Omaha, and possibly only three, depending on the outcomes of these two games to date. Is that abnormal? It feels abnormal, yeah. but I don't know if it actually is. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it definitely is. Usually you, you're going to have a mixture. You're never going to get all eight top seeds, but you're going to get five, you know, sometimes four. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I guess, you know, depending on Oregon State and Stanford, we still could, but – uh, it's it, it has been a little bit more balanced this year, and I think part of that is is the extra COVID year. You've got teams that are older who maybe aren't as talented, so they're not the you know the, they're not full of draft guys, so that maybe they're not ranked as high, but they're they're still very skilled, and and they have that experience to lean on. And I think because of that, you've seen some older, experienced teams that kind of figured it out. Um, being able to have success in a small sample size. You're not talking about a big season. You're talking about a small tournament against teams that may have more talent, certainly more professional talent. And and it just kind of evens it. I want to go back to Ole Miss for a second. Hunter Elliott and, and what you saw from him yesterday. He, he's gotten himself into trouble early in games with, with traffic on the bases, walks, hit batters, pitch count getting elevated early. He was sitting on 54 pitches through five innings. His final line is seven and a third with 10 strikeouts and no walks and three hits allowed, and two of those come in the, the last inning. That what, what, what's, the, what's the ceiling there? What, what's the upside for Hunter Elliott, the freshman at Ole Miss? Yeah, the thing that struck me, Richard, about him the other day or yesterday is that if he got two strikes on you, he put you away. It wasn't necessarily a strikeout, although, you know, he had, he had quite a few. But he made the pitches. He didn't nibble. He came right after you. And uh, Southern Miss, you know, they had some older guys that know how to fight off pitches. And and he, it didn't matter, right? He was able to do that. And that's the thing. The stuff is there. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not first-round draft pick stuff or, he, or he's not here to begin with. But I, I do think that his pitchability – and his his movement on the ball was more than I expected, right? And I don't know. I didn't see him a lot earlier in the year, but these last mm-hmm. few weeks, he's been a different guy. And and I don't, you know, it's like we're saying, is this is this what we're going to see in Omaha? Because if we do, oh my goodness, Ole Miss has got two starters that'll stack up with anybody. Well, and he's got one thing you can't teach, right? So, so not first round draft pick stuff right now, and wasn't coming out of high school, but he, he he's coming at you from that left side, and yeah. and so who knows? Maybe he elevates to that point in the way that you know Doug McKenzie climbed draft ladders. And he's still a young kid, and I think that the the thing that impressed me, you know, you, you were in the press conference. He just seems like he's having fun out there. Nothing <laughs> seems to phase him. You know, it's it's like he's at, you know asking you know, answering difficult questions. And he's like, oh, hum, this is, I do this all the time, guys. This is no big deal to me. And yeah. to be 19, I guess is what he is, and have that kind of maturity. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very impressive. And that, that to me was probably the biggest takeaway because uh, Delusia has been good, you know, more of the year, right? And he's been the kind of guy that Ole Miss has leaned on. But if, if, if they've got two of those cats now, um, that's that's different because you know how it is with the format. Once you get to Omaha, if you stay in the winners bracket, you really only need two starters until the championship series. So yeah. you you can you, you can kind of stretch that out. And you know I don't know what they would have done in Game Three. I know that's kind of been you know a, a challenge at times. But if you don't have to use that third guy for a while, then you know you, Ole Miss has got to got to like their chances.